Good afternoon, and welcome to the Multi-State Collaborative on Military Credits, presenting of post-secondary non-completion among veterans, contributing factors and implications. Of course, we want to thank our sponsors, Lumina Foundation and Strata Education Network. My name is Sarah Appel, and I am the Collaborative on Military Credit Manager and I am an employee here at the Midwestern Higher Education Compact. A couple of housekeeping rules. Uh, we do the questions through the chat feature, so if you do have a question, please type that in, and we will follow up with that uh, probably throughout the conversation. And a brief overview of the MCMC. The mission is to facilitate an interstate partnership of 13 states and to translate competencies acquired by veterans through military training and experiences toward college credentials. States exchange information and share best practices in the areas of articulation of credit, certification and licensure, communication, and data and technology. Our project goals assist states and post-secondary institutions in aiding military-connected students with critical life transitions from the military to post-secondary education, and then from post-secondary education to civilian employment. We try to increase post-secondary education completion rates by creating models for the consistent, transparent, and effective awarding of credit for military training and experience that can be scaled uh, regionally and nationally, thereby lowering the cost of education and reducing the time to completion. And the last one here is establish a strong network of support, communication, documentation, and data collection among institutions and organizations for the purpose of promoting shared interests and tracking the efficacy of efforts to enhance military-connected students' educational success. We have four knowledge communities, articulation of academic credit, which is our largest one, communication and outreach, data system and technology, and licensure and certification. We're very happy and delighted to have our presenters today. We have Walter Olchenko, from the, who's the Research Director at Veterans Education Success, and Kathy Paella, who also works at the Veteran Education Success as a Senior Research Fellow. So, uh, Walter, I will turn it over to you. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, First, I want to thank you for inviting us to uh, give this presentation. Um, I wanted to just say a few words about VES, who are we? Um, so we're a small DC-based nonprofit dedicated to defending and protecting the integrity and promise of the GI Bill. Uh, we're established in 2013. Uh, we have about eight or nine employees at this point. Um, so I, I want to tell you a little bit about our data sources and uh, methodology. So um, I think, as you know, we, we used um, a longitudinal survey of first-time students uh, that's um, um, put out by the Department of Education. It's called Beginning Post-Secondary Students. So each cycle of BPS follows a cohort of students, including veterans, and it collects information on their persistence, completion, transition to employment, demographic characteristics, their income, uh, both household and student loan debt. Uh, the survey that we used uh, surveyed students in 2011-12, and there was a follow-up survey in 2014, uh, and there will be another. There was another follow-up survey in 2017, and that latest iteration of the longitudinal lunch, survey should be published uh, this spring. Um, we also used the National Post-Secondary Student Aid Study to examine several issues that are not captured by PS by DPS, and that's because of the relatively short time frame covered by the, the first two cycles of DPS interviews. Um, our estimates were derived from PowerStats, which is the department's web-based analytical software, and um, thanks to my, my colleague, uh, Kathy, for doing all that uh, PowerStats work. Um, to provide context, we compared veteran outcomes to those of non-independent veteran students, uh, non-independent students, rather. So before I start, I wanted to say one thing about um, the veterans uh, that we, uh, the, the data from on veterans that we analyzed. First of all, not all, the, all not all of the vets uh, were using the GI Bill, and 
because we didn't have any way of determining why they weren't using HI Bill, we, uh, our analysis was based on all the veterans in the sample. Um, it turns out that 37% of the first-time student vets weren't using benefits in 2014. And uh, Sarah said you're all familiar with the GI Bill, but I just wanted to uh, mention one thing, that in, as of 2017, there were about 900,000 beneficiaries using the GI Bill, primarily the post-9-11 GI Bill, and expenditures uh, on the post-9-11 GI Bill were over $80 billion um, at that point. So uh, the first slide really talks about um, where veterans were enrolled. And as you can see, the majority are actually in um, public institutions. Um, a very small proportion, about 6%, are in nonprofits. And as you'll see, the sample sizes were often too small to report results for nonprofit institutions. Um, of those in public institutions, of 58%, 49% were in two year institutions, and 11% were in four year institutions. Uh, the enrollment pattern for non-veterans was similar. So, yeah, I guess our, our, our main finding is that the uh, non-completion among independent students, non-veteran independent students, was actually higher than among veterans. Uh, it was actually double the rate for veterans. 20% of veterans left without a degree by 2014 compared to 40% of veteran independent students. Um, and if you look at the uh, data in the, in the uh, figure, you'll see that by sector, attainment at for profits exceeded that of public institutions after three years. Um, most veterans are certificates, and we find that they're more commonly offered by for profit schools and who often require students to enroll full-time, which helps to boost the graduation rates. And so I think that partially explains why uh, more veterans at for-profit schools have actually earned certificates than at uh, public institutions. Um, looking at the uh, next slide, um, I think that, you know, BPS really likely overstates non-completion. Uh, becomes, because some veterans take breaks and re-enroll. Um, so if you look at the data in the, in the figure, you'll see that stopouts are actually more common among those who are still enrolled or graduated than among those who left. Um, I'm just going to mention something at the beginning, and I forgot, but it, I, I think it actually fits in here now. Um, today we had a, a panel on Capitol Hill and invited congressional staff to attend. We had four veterans who... Um, at various points in, in pursuing a post-secondary education uh, were non-completers. And all of these veterans stopped out uh, at some point. Um, there were recurring themes I thought were interesting. They all attended multiple institutions. Some experienced a lack of campus support for veterans. For some, health issues and personal issues affected their academic performance. For some, the school was a culture shock, uh, and they may have lacked confidence in their own abilities. Financial issue, uh, issues contributed to interruptions in their attendance. In some cases, VA payments were late or insufficient to cover their, their living expenses, and some had to work full or part-time while in school. And for a couple of them, uh, their attendance was interrupted by active duty service. So I, I think these are all uh, challenges uh, for veteran students. Uh, but I think the good news for these four veterans is that two of them are now back in school pursuing their degrees, and two actually have, one has earned an associate degree and another has earned a bachelor's degree. Um, so th the next slide, I think, really fits into this narrative of the, of the four veterans I was just talking about. Um, so at the beginning, I mentioned that we also use National Post-Secondary Student uh, NIPSAS to look at uh, Persistence, and we did that because the uh, NIPSAS data is, is um, more complete in terms of persistence than BPS because the, the data we were using was only really um, three years after they first enrolled, and so most anybody pursuing a bachelor's degree obviously is not going to complete it in three years. So what we found when we looked at NIPSAS data is that veteran persistence really is strong. 
40 uh, percent who completed certificates or degrees in 2015 or 16 began their education in 2005 or earlier. Um, so it, it takes uh, quite a bit of time sometimes for a veteran to earn a degree. And, you know, we, we had in some earlier work used um, baccalaureate and beyond to look at, at people who earned bachelor's degrees in 2009. And we found that 60% of, of uh, veterans who earned bachelor's degrees in 2008 actually uh, took 10 years to complete. Um, so looking at the next slide, um, what are the demographics of uh, veterans who left? Uh, compared to uh, non-veterans, they tended to be older. They were 20, majority were 25 to 45 years old or older. Um, another interesting characteristic is a lot of them were first generation. Um, they were single or married with dependents. Um, and uh, as I mentioned before, uh, quite a few had a, a disability. So the um, next slide looks at risk factors. Um, so first of all, what are the risk factors uh, for non-completion? Um, one is not having a high school diploma. Uh, another one is part-time enrollment. Uh, another one is having a disability. Um, yet another is having dependents or being a single parent. Um, Two more, being a first-generation student, and uh, another one attending two or more schools. Um, so basically what this figure shows is that uh, four times as many veterans who left exhibited five or more risk factors associated with non-completion compared to those who graduated. So you can see that 17 percent of, uh, of um, veterans, I'm sorry, 29 percent of veterans who left. Uh, just 21 percent of veterans or less um, had um, five or more risk factors compared to four percent of those who earned a degree. Um, so uh, as I mentioned for the this, this, this four veterans that we had today, quite a few of these veterans had some had these um, risk factors, uh, disabilities, um, the uh, um, well, particularly the, the, the disabilities, um, and attending attending multiple schools during the course of their pursuit of a post-secondary education. So our next talk, slide talks about um, online. Um, it's a particular interest of ours because um, veterans are um, more likely to go to school online, um, and more likely, or not more likely, but likely to be recruited by a for-profit school. Um, what we found that was that non-completion was much higher among veterans who took courses exclusively online at for-profit schools. Um, so you can see that 36% um, of veterans took, who left took their classes exclusively online compared to 19% at public institutions and only 12%. I guess we don't have non non-profit uh, compares 19% at, at public institutions. Um, and we do plan to do some work on, on uh, online education in the future. Uh, it's a topic of great interest to us. So th the next slide um, talks about debt. Um, so cumulative debt and the proportion of borrowed was lower among those who left compared to those who are still enrolled or graduated. Um, and that makes sense because the longer you're in school, uh, if you do need to borrow, the, the, the more likely you are to accumulate debt. Um, interestingly enough, um, about 75% of um, veterans actually had, had uh, no debt. Um, and Let's move on to the next slide. Um, so how much debt did, did uh, veterans end up with? Um, 
so the majority of veterans who left had debt between about 5,000, 500, and 19,000. Uh, and here it is, but 75% left with no debt. Um, so, you know, one, one thing I might uh, address quickly is why is it that veterans actually borrow? Um, because they have a, a generous uh, benefit. Well, first of all, 30% of veterans are only eligible for partial benefits because, because they served less than three years on active duty after September 10th, 2001. And they aren't eligible for the yellow ribbon program to help cover any gap between benefits and the cost of college. You have to be at 100% eligibility to qualify for the post to the yellow ribbon benefit. Um, you know, one of the risk factors that we mentioned are family circumstances, such as having they could have a non-working spouse, they could have children, they could have child care expenses uh, that are going to complicate their their family's financial situation. Um, some veterans may take out low interest federal student loans to pay down higher interest uh, rate debt that they have. And part-time attendance and enrolling in an exclusively online program results in a reduction in or elimination of benefits for living and book expenses. So these are all reasons why, uh, why veterans may borrow. Um, so I, I think going back to uh, the slide about the amount of debt, um, a larger proportion of non-veterans, 47% who left, had lower debt levels than vets who left, uh, which was 31%. Um, so the next slide um, looks at debt uh, at for-profit compared to public institutions. Um, so 79% of veterans who left a for-profit school had debt uh, on average $7,200, compared to about 29% of veterans at public institutions who had average debt of $6,740. Um, so I, I think this attests to the, in part at least, to the high cost of uh, for-profit uh, schools um, and the relatively low cost of public institutions. Um, you know, and the of course, the, the GI Bill, the post-911 GI Bill, covers 100% of in-state tuition. Um, and for a for-profit, uh, it covers up to about 24000 So if the cost of the for-profit school is above that, um, that's an out-of-pocket expense for the veteran, uh, particularly if the school doesn't participate in the Yellow Ribbon Program or if the veteran's not 100% uh, eligible. So the next slide looks at um, veterans' repayment challenges. Um, uh, this is particularly interesting, and I, th I think in the future, especially when the, the next generation comes up, we want to look more at um, repayment challenges. Um, there was no data about uh, default in, in the uh, data set that we used, but we think that by uh, after five years, we should have some default data. But you can see how many veterans um, actually, uh, and it's, it's pretty interesting that it's fairly consistent for veterans and non-veterans. Uh, for those who left, um, you know, 79% of veterans had at least one to five delinquencies, and 19% had six or more delinquencies. Um, and uh, similarly, quite a few uh, veterans, 80% had a forbearance. Um, so these are kind of sobering uh, data, and I, I think, you know, kind of attest to, I think, what most people think is that non-completion uh, of a degree, with, especially when you have debt, you know, leads to financial uh, problems for, for veterans and for all students. Walter, this is Sarah. Um, we have a question mm -hmm. about um, what is the definition of nonprofit in these data? And um, I went to slide back, and I think that's where uh, you, you really kind of hit home about uh, the amount of debt that these students carry after um, they leave. So mm -hmm. what kind of definition did you and Kathy use when identifying these? Uh, Kathy can... Um take that question if, if, I, if what I'm saying is incorrect. But, I, you know, I think, I think, you know, in the database they're identified 
by sector. So, you know, I mean, um, I, I think we use whatever the Department of Education uses to define a school. Now, I don't know, is, your, is the question related to the fact that some for-profits are now converting to nonprofit status? Is that part of the... I guess not. So, um, Kathy, do you have anything to add to that? No, that was exactly, I was thinking the same thing, that um, the data that, that we have would have been for institutions defined and students defined effective 2011 and 12, and the nonprofit institutions are those um, not drawing income versus a for-profit entity is solely there collecting fees and um, are able to access those um, to pay investors and other entities. So it was pretty clear cut then. We have seen in our work since that time with some more recent data that the definition is the same for profit or nonprofit, but what we're beginning to see is as some of those as some of the for profit schools um, reclassify themselves as nonprofit. Um, the results are a bit murkier. I hope that helps. Yes. Um, so Kathy, I, this is Sarah. I, I, uh, I'm sorry. Uh, just to clarify, um, the attendee asked, I would just lump public institutions in with nonprofit. So is nonprofit just private nonprofit institutions? Exactly. Yes, that's correct. Yeah. Now, the, right. the concern I would have about loving them, I think there are many behaviors that are similar, um, including much of the completion data um, might be similar between the two. But what's different about the non private nonprofit is the tuition, the sticker price that they have, which would drive those students tend to borrow more, they would have greater debt. So I wouldn't lump them together for that reason. Just a thought. Very good. Thank you. Any other questions before we proceed? All right. Uh, I will take us back up. Um, Actually, there's just well, one more slide. Okay. There we go. Right. So, um, you know, I, I think um, at a high level, you know, what did we take away from uh, the research that we did? And I think one thing that was really pretty clear to us is, is that student veterans are resilient, uh, and their resiliency exceeds that of non-veterans. They may take a long time to complete, but they um, have a stick to um, that you know, eventually leads to uh, a positive outcome. Um, and I, I think that you know, the one of the, the things that we uh, concluded too is that there probably are some things that institutions and the federal government could do to alleviate some of the risk factors that uh, and to help bolster completion. So uh, you know one of the risk factors is, is having children and um, campus-based daycare options for those with children, uh, particularly single parents, are really helpful. Um, I think another thing institutions can do is to give grants and work study uh, and maybe. Uh, the grants could help with daycare. Um, something that I was talking with Sarah about before we went online was the high level of disability among veterans um, and raises the question about how easy it is for them to access VA and campus-based health care. And Sarah was mentioning that, you know, for a veteran it may take a while to actually get an appointment with VA. And when they have that appointment, if they conflict with a class, you know, they, they really don't have much of an option except to keep that appointment because it's so hard to get. Um, so finally, I think um, there's been a lot of research about uh, risk factors and, and there's some programs that, that um, try and, and help students to succeed. Uh, and I think what they found is that um, Fostering persistence and entertainment really requires addressing multiple risk factors. You can't just look at one uh, and expect working on just that one factor is going to uh, boost veteran completion. Uh, 
uh, you really have to work on multiple factors at the same time. Um, and lastly, um, you know, I, I think that we're, we're, we definitely think that um, it's good for the military to help prepare veterans for the rigors of higher education before they are discharged. That should be, again, early in their active duty career. Um, and I think that would, you know, help to, to ease the transition of veterans into uh, higher education once they, they actually uh, start to use their GI Bill. And with that, if you have any more questions, we'd be happy to answer them. This is Sarah. Um, I have a couple questions. Uh, one thing that I've been trying to find research or data on over the past several years is we always use the term um, the average number of schools that military-connected students uh, go to and attend. Um, what is that average number? I read someplace that it's eight. I've read someplace that it's five. Um, I was just curious what your thoughts were. Yeah, I, I, I know that it's common for, for veterans to um, go to a, a number of schools before, uh, as, as they're pursuing a post-secondary post degree. I mean, we see this in the data. Uh, maybe, Kathy, I don't know if you remember uh, any of that uh, off the top of your head, but um, it wasn't uncommon for even looking at veterans over a three-year period to find out that they had been to uh, several institutions uh, during that time period. Um, I, I'm, I'm, I'm not aware. I've not really seen any data on the number of institutions. Mm -hmm. um, so, but that's something I'll keep in mind. If I come across anything, I'll be sure to let you know. Oh, appreciate that very much. And in speaking with these military-connected students, um, I think a lot of uh, folks are now facing issues with elder care. Um, they have parents or a parent um, who needs uh, some regular, consistent uh, care. Have you come across uh, any uh, military-connected students that have mentioned that as one of the um, you know, challenges that they face in getting their college career completed? No, I, I, I haven't, but I, I, can, I can imagine that that could be an issue for older veterans. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I, I think in the sample um, there were uh, veterans that were complete tended to be older. Um, mm -hmm. I hadn't thought of that, but that's an interesting point. Thanks. You know, the, Does the anyone else mentioned, have any? I'm sorry. Go ahead. The other thing I wanted to, to mention related to your, your question about number of institutions they attended. Um, you know, one of the one of the veterans on the panel this morning, um, he had enrolled enrolled in school, um, and and he dropped out to join the military. So he, I don't know if he earned any credits or not, but I think it's not uncommon for for. Um, uh, a service member to start school and then decide that's not for them at the time and then to join the military. And, um, you know, while you're in the military, there's, you have access to um, something called tuition assistance. And uh, under the tuition assistance program, you can uh, earn credits towards a college degree. Uh, each year, I think you, you can you have available up to $4,500 to pay for tuition. Um, and you know, frequently uh, military students enroll online because their their situation, their work schedules. Um, so by the time someone becomes a veteran, they they have touched the higher education system multiple times already. Um, and we do have another question, kind of related, uh, mm -hmm. I think, around um, Kathy's area of researching. Uh, the question or statement is, as a veteran and institutional researcher, I'm interested in knowing if there are any valid measures being used and or in the development that can uh, or could be administered on college and university campuses. Could they elaborate on what they mean by valid measures? Mm -hmm. We'll give them a minute. <laughs> so a couple of things just come to mind about that. Um, 
One of the great things about these data, data that are available um, from the federal government or entities that research um, veterans and other students, is that it gives veterans and other students the opportunity of anonymity. And on campus at times, I have read that some veterans are very good about stepping out and ensuring that they are seen and counted and getting the support that they need, and others are working hard to assimilate. So I would just point out that that is something I hear that is a great challenge about um, measuring or interacting or collecting data about veterans locally. Um, and I don't know if that's the exact topic, but I have read a bit that that, that is a challenge. Um, mm -hmm. Fortunately, entities like yours and Veterans Education Success and many of the um, nonprofit entities that work with veterans mm -hmm. do a great job at representing them. So, you know, there's both, there's both sides of it that um, they need all of the support that we can get. But the good thing about those data available through NCES is they survey students in multiple ways, online, by phone, you know, get data from financial aid offices. So they're able to, you know, in a less direct way, um, gather data. So backdoor data is always good, um, trying as long as a veteran is identified on campus. Um, financial aid offices certainly are careful to be sensitive to their needs. Um, completion data are usually available through register, um, the registrar's offices. So I don't know, when I say backdoor, I mean there's probably a lot that is available that we don't think of um, because we find the most useful to be a direct contact with a veteran. But those are just some sure. immediate thoughts that jumped out. Sure. So our participant was referring to something like NESI, the uh, national survey uh, for student engagement that's done through uh, Indiana University. Um, and he also made the comment, and I think this is important because obviously I think schools are doing this, um, the schools are creating their own homegrown surveys but nothing that has gone through validity or a reliability process. Yeah, I, while, while uh, Kathy was talking, I, I took the acronym and put it into my Google search engine. And uh, I have to admit I'm not familiar with those. It, it sounds um, interesting, though. Uh, I, I, yeah, I'm, I'm sorry, but I can't really, uh, really answer the question. I'm not, not familiar with it. Okay, um, we do have another question. Does this research distinguish veteran data by category, meaning post 9-11 vets, voc rehab, um, veterans not using the GI Bill? It definitely uh, distinguishes veterans um, who are not using the GI Bill versus veterans who are. Um, I, Kathy can correct me if, if I'm wrong, but I think the BPS that we used d didn't indicate which benefit they were using. Um, I think it's fair to say that most are using the post-9-11 GI Bill. And even if you're in voc rehab, you're using the post-9-11 GI Bill, even if you have other services to voc rehab. Uh, but I think in, you know, in NIPSAS now, NIPSAS 16, does indicate which benefit program I think they're using. Is that right, Kathy? Mm -hmm. Correct. That's what I was going to say is that in the future, starting with NIPSA 2015-16, um, they had the benefit of actually receiving data, doing data exchange with the VA. So the data are much more specific to programs as well as oversampling for veterans. So it's exciting moving forward um, with the, those data sources. And we do have another question, uh, and this one's um, very interesting. Can you provide any additional support when advocating for institutions, scholarship grants for veterans who are actually using those post-9/11 GI Bill yellow yellow ribbon benefits, but they are still falling short for tuition fees? You know the, the way the yellow ribbon program works, if a, student, if a school participates in it, they decide how much of the gap uh, or the difference between actual tuition fees and the benefit um, they're going to cover. And then 
you know, so say for example, the the gap is a thousand dollars. The school decides that they're going to pay five hundred dollars, and DA will pay the other five hundred dollars. But they don't have to um, cover the entire gap. They can just cover a portion of that one. They could say cover two hundred dollars. DA would cover two hundred, and the veteran still owes six hundred. Um, the um, so it, you know it, it's it really depends on on, on the institution and, and the, the uh, situation of the veteran. Mm-hmm. Um, that same uh, participant also said uh, that she appreciated your highlighting of the risk factors, um, and I think those are those risk factors are something that all of our institutions need to keep in mind uh, when creating programs or. Uh, you know, thinking about uh, assisting veterans in higher education. So, uh, again, thank you for looking at those risk factors for us. Um, we do have another comment um, input. Vets are eligible for Pell Grant scholarships, et cetera. Um, they need to submit a FAFSA, and that's absolutely true. And um, that can also help them maybe get a campus work study or something as well to, um, you know, provide uh, some funding to bridge that gap. But thank you for that, Howard. We appreciate it. Yeah, one thing I would say about work-study, I, I don't know if this is still true, but um, I, I had the impression that, that the number of work-study slots at a lot of schools was, was pretty low. Um, before I started working for BES, I, um, I, did, I don't know if I mentioned this, but I used to work at GAO, and GAO loan staff to the Hill, and so I had a, a detail on the Hill for two years where I worked on veterans' educational issues. And we went up to Rutgers, who had a very strong program for, um, for veterans. And they actually had 100 work, work study slots. And mm-hmm. uh, I was kind of surprised that they had so many, but you know, they had a veteran center, um, and essentially the work study slots, slots were for veterans to come in and man the desk there and answer the phones. And so uh-huh. they could study while they were while they were working. And yet, I think, uh, 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 if I understand it correctly, you can get up to ten thousand dollars in a work study grant. So um, it's a pretty meaningful grant, or a pretty meaningful yeah. way to get extra extra funds. Mm-hmm. So another question has popped up: Are you talking about financial aid work study or VA's work study program? Uh, financial aid uh, work study. Okay. And I think that the VA students, um, I think it's like uh, for, ever, for every X amount of veterans you, on your campus, you get one veteran work study student uh, to work on just veterans' issues. Um, and we do have a couple comments. Uh, the VA work study students are paid the federal or state minimum rate uh, on an hourly basis. And then the, v, the number of VA work study positions is tied to the number of veteran students, one per 100. So um, thank you guys for verifying that. We appreciate it very much. So there are options out there uh, for our military connected students uh, to, you know, bring in some additional funding and then close that gap with their uh, tuition and fees. Oh, yeah, I, and we do have a couple of comments that um, the, I believe it is the VA work study positions are not taxed income. Yay! And um, we had another one, <laughs> we had another one um, say that veterans often fill out the FAFSA while they're still on active duty. And that can definitely, you know, make a change um, within their, their benefits. Yeah. I, um, I mean, generally, uh, veterans' income is higher than than that of uh, you know, um, non-veteran independent students, um, and mm-hmm. so at least maybe if they, especially if you go to school right after you're out of the military, you might not qualify for a Pell Grant the first year, but then maybe you will by the second year. Mm-hmm. Well, he also made this very good comment uh, that they need to refile when full time. Uh, when they're full-time students because they can qualify for additional grants and scholarships. So thank you so much for that piece of advice. Uh, absolutely, they, they need to stay on top of that financial aid piece. Um, and then we have another comment. 
uh, I do believe according to the Department of Labor, uh, the VA students uh, would be able to do professional, um, I'm sorry, that they would be able to get uh, the state wage if it's higher than the federal, which is always good news. Um, and ad some additional comments are, I do believe according to the Department of Labor, they will get the state wage if higher than the federal. Um, and we do have some input. Vets transitioning from military are able to do professional judgments with their financial aid office, which is, always, again, uh, our folks need to stay in contact with, that, with those financial aid folks. Um, there is a three-page amendment to the FAFSA that uh, students need to complete. And grant scholarships and fellowships go on resumes. So it's also a career enhancer. Thank you. And that, another excellent point. Do we have any other questions? So one last question for you, uh, Walter and, and Kathy. Uh, where do you see the next steps of this study going? Do you look for it to be um, enlarged to look at some other characteristics, or are you going to continue to uh, stay on uh, the path that you've already started? Well, I, I think that we, we uh, definitely want to look at, at completion uh, again because, um, you know, as I mentioned at the beginning, some of these veterans may have stopped out and then maybe have re-enrolled. So we're looking forward to the, uh, the new iteration of the longitudinal study. Um, I think I also mentioned that, you know, there, there really wasn't any data about um, defaulting. Uh, so um, hopefully the, the new data set is going to allow us to uh, look at some areas that uh, really there wasn't enough data because of the short time frame of the first two iterations of this survey. Um, you know, I, I think finances is, is another area. Uh, you know, salaries uh, after graduation, we should have, have better information on that and, and mm -hmm. with a five-year look back and with just three years. Very good. Any other additional questions? All right, we'll move on um, here with the, the additional slides. Um, so, of course, I have to uh, advertise our, our next upcoming <laughs> webinar. Uh, the next one is in Data We Trust, supporting military-connected students with national and local data sources. And it's presented by Katie Giardello, who is a doctoral student in higher education leadership at Western Michigan University. And she is a consultant with the Michigan Center for Student Success. And she's um, actually been an MCMC member, steering committee member for several years. So uh, Katie is also married to a former Marine, so she gets the, uh, the home life uh, stress sometimes. Um, that's going to be on April 9th. And it will be 1 to 2 p.m. Central. And there is the website that you can go to um, to register. Uh, we do have lots of resources available on our website. You can always review past webinars um, on our YouTube channel. And for any additional information that you would like about uh, MEC or the uh, Multi-State Collaborative on Military Credit, you can always check out that link. And we always appreciate it when you join the conversation on our Facebook page, which is located at MEC MCMC. And if you have any additional questions or, or thoughts about, uh, you know, webinars or um, getting in contact with some of the folks that uh, you might see on our resources page, please feel free to reach out to me. Again, my name is Sarah Appel, and I am the manager for the Multi-State Collaborative on Military Credit. So with that, we'll give you uh, 15 minutes, almost 15 minutes back of your day. And thank you all for uh, joining us and for the really good questions. And um, these slides will be sent to you uh, shortly. Thanks so much. Have a great day.